All right, so we've talked about osmosis at least a couple of times this semester already. Okay. But let's start by drawing a cell and talking about those features of osmosis, those particulars of osmosis that are going to be particularly relevant to our discussion of osmoregulation. So if that's a cell, uh, the, the structure that I actually drew would be the membrane, which is selectively permeable. And for our purposes, we need just to remember that large polar molecules and charged solutes, proteins, these are things that would not be allowed to pass through the selectively permeable membrane. Water molecules, however, are, are small enough to pass right through the cracks in the phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipids move around, they shuffle around, voids open up, and water molecules can squeeze through really quickly. Now when we think about all of the solutes that are there inside of the membrane, inside of your typical cell. A living cell can be sort of thought of as a bag of solutes. What are the solutes that are in that bag, right? Well, the composition of this aqueous solution would include things like respiratory gases, um, a variety of molecules we call metabolites, that's anything from the food or nutrient molecules we take in all the way to the molecules of waste that are produced at the end of the metabolic processes. We've got electrolytes, which is basically an old school and fancy term for ions, things that have charges. We also have a, we also have a wide array of proteins. And the proteins might not necessarily be in solution. They'll, you know, they're technically suspended in that aqueous layer or holding on to intracellular structures. But all of these features contribute to what we call osmotic pressure. Okay? All of these things, whether they're gases or uh, dissolved polar solutes or ions or even these proteins, they're sort of in there exerting their own demands over the water molecules that are there in the solution. Anything that's in solution that's hydrophilic is going to be commanding the attention of water molecules, as, as many water molecules as they can get. They sort of try to monopolize the water molecules for themselves. The greater number of actual particles of all of these solutes, the greater the demand for water molecules in that solution. Okay? And we see this when we have a concentration gradient across the membrane, across that selectively permeable membrane. If you have a cell that's surrounded by fresh water, and by fresh water I mean something having very close to zero solutes, no solutes on the outside, which basically means that we've got no, uh, no particles on the outside that are going to be commanding the attention of the water molecules. Okay? Inside of the membrane we've got all these solutes, gases, metabolites, etc. that are commanding the attention of the water molecules. There's much more demand for water molecules inside relative to outside of the cell, and so we get movement of water in the direction into the cell. Right? We call this endosmosis, which basically means osmosis into the cell. And this is the phenomenon that we expect any time that a cell finds itself, not necessarily in fresh water, but any time that the cell finds itself in some type of hypotonic milieu. Now we could take that same cell and put it into a seawater environment or at least some type of saltwater environment in which the concentration of solutes is greater than what we have inside the cell. In other words, this is going to be a hypertonic environment with more solutes than what we have on the inside. And so if I draw the cell's milieu like this, uh, we have a much higher concentration of osmotic solutes outside of the cell compared to inside the cell. And all these solutes on the outside are commanding, they're, they're basically demanding the attention of water molecules uh, more water molecules are there on the inside of the cell, and so the water molecules move in the other direction. We have exosmosis, and the outcome of this is that the cell will tend to lose volume, will tend to shrivel up or crenate. Okay. Now the third possibility would be for our little cell to find itself in an isotonic milieu in which the outside concentration is the same as what we have on the inside. In this case, the demand on the water molecules is equivalent both inside and outside of the membrane, and so we end up having no net osmosis, and this would be a situation of equilibrium, osmotic equilibrium. And so we quantify the osmotic concentration, the osmotic status of our cell, the overall osmotic pressure exerted by this mixed bag of solutes by the concentration that we have in an isotonic solution with only a single solute. 
And so if we were to find that an isotonic solution of glucose, that's the solution at the concentration at which we've got no net osmosis of water either into or out of the cell, was 0 0.3 moles per liter. Okay. That would give us an ability to estimate the overall osmotic pressure of all of those solutes that we have inside of the cell. It's not that we have exactly 0 0.3 moles of glucose per liter inside the cell. What we're saying here is that the demand for water on both sides of the membrane are the same if the solution on the outside has got a concentration of 0 0.3 moles. Right. And it turns out that the molar concentration for most types of osmotic solutes, the molar concentration is the determining factor of where we end up with an isotonic solution. Okay. For example, in the case of sodium chloride, you'd be able to make an isotonic saline solution for the same cell by using 0 0.15 moles of sodium chloride per liter. Why 0 0.15 instead of 0 0.3? Well, having taken chemistry, you should be able to tell me that, right? When you take salt, sodium chloride, and dissolve it in water, it dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions. And so once we have this dissociation of the ions in sodium chloride, we actually end up with 0 0.15 moles per liter of sodium ions, 0 0.15 moles per liter of chloride ions, which gives us a total concentration of 0 0.3 molars of total solutes. Okay? This idea of moles per liter of total solutes is going to be really useful for us, and we're going to be replacing that term with the concept of an osmole per liter. Osmoles per liter is going to be the same as moles per liter of total solutes. Okay? In the typical cell of a human, a 0 0.3 osmoles per liter is about the expected osmotic pressure that we find inside of cells. Okay? Another way of expressing this is to use milliosmoles per liter. And so using our standard metric conversion, you could say that this is the same as 300 milliosmoles per liter milliosmoles per liter is going to be the unit that we use in describing the concentration of osmotic solutes in different cells in different milieu. Now with an intracellular osmotic pressure of 300 milliosmoles per liter, this puts us kind of smack in between two of our most important aquatic habitats that we have on the planet Earth. Uh, freshwater habitats are effectively at zero milliosmoles per liter. Okay, you know, it's it's probably not totally zero, that would be like distilled water, but closer to zero than to 300, far closer to zero than to 300. Marine habitats, that is seawater, uh, tend to be really close to around 1,000 milliosmoles per liter. So there are not too many places where a human cell could find itself in a milieu in which it would be able to achieve osmotic equilibrium. We provide exactly that milieu with our plasma, with our interstitial fluids, which are maintained roughly at the same osmotic concentration that we have inside of our cells. Okay? If you were to take a human cell and put it into fresh water, you would have endosmosis. We'd probably have endosmosis to the point where it would explode. You'd have so much water flowing in, the volume would increase, and the plasma membrane would be not able to contain that pressure that we have on the inside. You take that same cell, put it into seawater, you would have mass exodus of water molecules through exosmosis, and the cell would shrivel up like a raisin. Now having said that, we realize that there are many cells that actually do find themselves living in freshwater habitats. A good example would be like the paramecium that we probably saw earlier in the semester during the microbes laboratory. Okay. Now we know that the freshwater milieu of the paramecium is roughly zero milliosmoles per liter. Okay. And we know that the cytoplasm is going to be substantially more concentrated in osmotic solutes than zero milliosmoles per liter. It'll probably be up closer to at least a couple of hundred. Okay? That's what cells need in order just to be alive. Okay? So if you're a paramecium living in freshwater habitats, what direction does water move? Yeah, I mean, through your general surfaces, you're going to have endosmosis and water is going to be flowing in all the time. You're going to have an influx of water molecules because that's what water molecules do. They move into the area in which we've got a greater demand for water molecules. Now if we don't have any compensating mechanism, the pressure inside the paramecium cell becomes really great. Okay? or the volume becomes greater and the paramecium eventually explodes. What has to happen is that we've got to have some type of compensatory mechanism that allows the cell to get rid of all of this excess water. Okay? And so in the case of a paramecium, we've got a little thing called the contractile vacuole. 
contractile vacuole does two things. One, it creates an interior concentration that is lower relative to what we have in the cytoplasm. In other words, we're able to create a hypotonic solution in the space inside the contractile vacuole. And the other thing that we do with the contractile vacuole is that we squeeze the contents out to the outside world. Okay? And so this contractile vacuole is effectively allowing the paramecium to pee off the extra water that it tends to be taking up at all times as a result of endosmosis. Now another freshwater organism, substantially larger and more complex, is the bluegill, which is a fish. Okay? And the bluegill's got many cells, and these cells are going to have intracellular concentrations that are substantially greater than the freshwater environment in which the bluegill is swimming. But those cells will be contained in a milieu that is isotonic to them. In other words, there's a plasma concentration in the bluegill that is roughly the same as what we have inside of the cells themselves. Let's say for argument's sake that the intracellular osmotic pressure as well as the plasma osmotic pressure is going to be roughly around 250 milliosmoles per liter. That means that this fish, in contact with the freshwater world, is also going to be absorbing water through its general surfaces via endosmosis. Now what happens in the fish is almost exactly parallel to what goes on in the paramecium with its contractile vacuole. The bluegill is creating a hypotonic solution inside of its kidneys. Right? The kidneys that we find inside of a freshwater fish are responsible for creating this hypotonic solution that is going to be voided from the fish. We basically pee off a hypotonic solution which allows the fish to compensate for the uptake of water that it has to deal with through endosmosis. Okay? In the case of both the fish and the paramecium, you could say that they're maintaining an osmotic concentration internally that's substantially different relative to the outside world. They're fighting against this onslaught of endosmosis and they're regulating this actively and we call this process osmoregulation. Now if instead of looking at these freshwater organisms we turn our attention to saltwater invertebrates. Saltwater invertebrates are primarily in a different category. We call them osmoconformers in which they're maintaining an internal osmotic concentration that's roughly the same as their outside world, as their marine environment, which as you remember is roughly around a thousand milliosmoles per liter. So if I draw for you a crab, what's going on is that we're maintaining about the same or maybe even a little bit higher osmotic concentration relative to the outside world. It's actually a good thing to be a little bit higher because that allows you to take in a little bit of water through endosmosis. But this situation puts the animal very close to being in osmotic concentration with the outside world, and this is why we call them osmoconformers. The plus side of being an osmoconformer is that we don't have to expend a whole lot of energy. We don't have to expend energy just maintaining an osmotic concentration internally that's very different from the outside world. Okay? In the case of the crab, uh, the plasma concentrations, the intracellular concentrations, their osmotic pressures, they've got to be elevated to something uh, close to 1,000 milliosmoles per liter, 1,000 or 1,050 or maybe even 1,100. Okay. So the question becomes, how are we going to make that high osmotic concentration? What are we going to do to elevate osmotic pressures above the 250 to 350 that we have in the majority of vertebrates? Okay. So I'm going to set up what we'll call a balance sheet for saltwater invertebrates, for saltwater osmoconformer. You can say that the osmotic solutes that are required for just being alive, remember cells have to do a lot of things, and, and so the osmotic solutes required just to be alive would be pretty substantial. I mean, if we use the cell of a vertebrate as a rough estimate, you could say that that number is going to be roughly 300 milliosmoles per liter. And the target osmotic concentration is roughly 1,000 milliosmoles per liter, which basically leaves a balance of 700 milliosmoles per liter that have to be added from somewhere. Okay? There has to be some source of additional osmotic solutes that can be added to both the cells and the plasma in order to make our friend the crab conform with the outside world. Okay? 
So this pretty substantial pool of additional solutes that have to go into plasma cells in order to make the difference between what they need just to be alive and where they need to be in order to be in osmotic equilibrium. It might be coming from metabolites, might be coming from additional proteins, and that's certainly done to a certain extent. But for a marine invertebrate, one of the most readily available sources of osmotic solutes would be sodium and chloride from the saltwater environment. After all, the 1,000 milliosmoles per liter that we find in seawater is mostly sodium and chloride. Okay? And that's really convenient. Now if we turn our attention to saltwater vertebrate osmoconformers, and by this I mean primarily sharks and rays, but pretty much any of the vertebrates that are not osteichthians are probably going to be osmoconformers. If you've got sharks, you might say they're pretty much the same story as what we have in crabs. An internal osmotic concentration that is maybe 1100, maybe, uh, maybe 1050, something a little bit higher than the marine world that we have on the outside, which is going to be, as before, about 1000 milliosmoles per liter. Okay. You've got that same balance sheet. You've got the required 300 milliosmoles per liter that's required for cellular function. You've got 1000, which is your target, and you've got a balance of 700 that's got to be made up from some other source. Okay. Now the difference between these vertebrate osmoconformers relative to the saltwater invertebrates is that the major source of these additional solutes is coming from metabolites, and in particular some of the metabolites that are associated with protein digestion. Right? Sharks are carnivores that eat tons of protein. They've got a lot of nitrogenous waste molecules, and one of these important nitrogenous waste molecules is urea. Urea is water soluble, it's not very toxic, and a big part of those 700 milliosmoles per liter worth of osmotic solutes that have to be added in the case of the shark's osmotic balance sheet is going to be made up of nitrogen-containing molecules like urea and squalamine. Now in the case of bony fish, or osteichthians, uh, they're all osmoregulators. And with this fish, look, it's got a narrow caudal peduncle and a stiff sickle-shaped tail. What does that tell you about the locomotion of this kind of fish? Well, in any case, it is a osmoregulator, and so its internal osmotic concentration is going to be roughly there around 300 or 400 milliosmoles per liter compared to the 1,000 milliosmoles per liter that we have on the outside. Okay. Now, because we've got this osmotic gradient, this fish is going to be subject to osmotic stress. Water is going to be moving in which direction? be into the fish or out of the fish? Yeah, out. Okay, water moves in the direction that tends to equilibrate the osmotic pressures on both sides. And so in order to compensate for this osmotic loss of water, this fish is going to either have to drink fresh water, which it doesn't really have the opportunity to do, or it's going to have to drink seawater and to excrete the excess salts. And that's exactly what this fish is doing. We're going to be drinking seawater and excrete the ions, excrete the sodium ions and chloride ions, both in the urine as well as from the gills. We have, a, we have basically an operating desalination system in the case of a saltwater fish. It's osmoregulating, it's maintaining this osmotic concentration internally that's substantially different from what we have on the outside, and it's doing so at considerable energetic cost. Okay? That cost is involved in desalinating the water that it's drinking. And it has to do this in order to maintain this osmotic balance. Okay, so at this point it should be pretty evident that osmoregulation in a saltwater environment is very different from osmoregulation in a freshwater environment. What has to be done, the physiological mechanisms involved, are considerably different in one osmotic milieu as opposed to the other. And it should be relatively surprising to you that there are some fishes that are capable of tolerating both salt water and fresh water, going back and forth between the two environments. We call these organisms urihaline, meaning that they have a wide range of tolerances for salinity. A, a urihaline osmoregulator would be something like a salmon, an anadromous salmon that swims up into fresh water to spawn, uh, basically starts its life in a freshwater stream and then migrates out to the sea and spends most of its life growing vegetatively entirely until it's ready to reproduce again, at which time it goes back into fresh water.
right? The opposite of urihaline is stenohaline, and these would be the organisms that have only a narrow range of tolerance, those freshwater fishes that would not be able to tolerate going out to sea to migrate from one stream to another, or saltwater fishes that would never be able to survive in a freshwater environment. Okay. Now this graph puts together both of the concepts, stenohaline versus urihaline, and osmoconformer versus osmoregulator. Now, as you might expect, environmental salinity is what we have on the x-axis. The left-hand side of this graph would be a freshwater environment. The right-hand side would be the most extreme salinities that we find in marine habitats. The y-axis here is expressed as plasma osmotic pressure. And what we mean there is the overall osmotic concentration, the number of milliosmoles per liter, in the plasma that's bathing the cells. Presumably, the cells are also isosmotic with the plasma. Okay? So in this graph, a perfect osmoconformer would be right there on the diagonal line the entire way. Okay? Now looking at a stenohaline osmoconformer in salt water, we can see that its osmotic concentration, its plasma osmotic pressure, never strays too far away from what you would expect for a perfect osmoconformer. Okay? In contrast, a stenohaline saltwater osmoregulator down here is always going to have an osmotic concentration pretty close to what you find in most other osmoregulators, okay? uh, roughly around 300 milliosmoles per liter. And it does that at the expense of ATP energy. These are the animals like the saltwater fishes that are running 24-7 these desalination plants in their bodies in order to compensate for the loss of water via exosmosis. Okay. Now way on the left hand side we've got a stenohaline osmoregulator. That's a freshwater organism that lives in an aquatic world in which the osmotic pressure, the environmental salinity, is well below the osmotic pressure that it has in its body tissues. Okay. Now the urihaline osmoregulator, this green horizontal line, is showing us pretty much what you'd expect for an osmoregulator. These guys are able to maintain a steady osmotic concentration, you know, roughly around 300 milliosmoles per liter, irrespective of what the outside environment is. But in the case of the urihaline osmoconformer, we see osmoconformity for the range of salinities that are equal to or above that of the osmotic minimum. But when these urihaline osmoconformers go into fresh water, they're basically osmoregulating. They, they're going to be maintaining an osmotic concentration substantially greater than that of the freshwater environments. So think about this and tell me. Why don't we have any examples of osmoconformers in fresh water? So far we've been talking about osmoregulation in aquatic organisms. Um, we're going to be moving now into terrestrial osmoregulators, which is pretty much all terrestrial organisms, uh, focusing on vertebrates. And unlike with the freshwater fishes and saltwater fishes, we're not thinking about endosmosis or exosmosis. Those terms don't really apply since we're not bathed and we've got this keratinized outer layer of skin covered with fur or feathers, which is effectively kind of like a watertight seal. Uh, our balance sheet for osmoregulation uh, which is the same as homeostasis of the internal osmotic pressure, is going to be simply a matter of making sure that the water in and the water out stays about the same day in and day out. Okay. Let's think first about the water that comes into a terrestrial animal. Obviously there's water consumed and this would include all the water-based drinks that you're likely to take in on a daily basis. Food also contain substantial amounts of water. But in the case of food, we've got to take into account both the moisture content, which is already water, moisture, as well as the metabolic water that's being produced as the animal is catabolizing its food items. For example, if you take sugar, C6H12O6, and we undergo aerobic metabolism of that aerobic respiration, we'll be consuming six molecules of O2. In the process, we're going to end up with six molecules of CO2, as well as six molecules of H2O. That water is also going to be thrown into the water budget. That's going to be water that the animal can count as part of its regular input of water into its body. Okay. Now water out is going to be consisting of evaporation, this includes over the general body surfaces as well as the evaporation that occurs inside of the respiratory tract. The air you breathe out often has a higher moisture content compared to the air you breathe in, and that's going to contribute to the water loss. Okay. You also have water that's being lost in the form of urine, as well as the moisture content of feces. Okay. 
In the bottom line here, it's actually a pretty easy balance sheet if the water in is equal to the water coming out. Then the animal is effectively maintaining a relatively stable osmotic pressure in its tissues. Okay? Now there's some degrees of conscious control. Okay? If an animal's osmotic pressure becomes too great, in other words, if the animal is dehydrating, uh, thirst centers in the brain will become active and the animal will start seeking water, or at least foods with greater moisture content. Okay? But there's another element to osmoregulation, and this is the one that we're connecting with the last physiological system, which is excretion. And, the, and, and what I'm talking about here is the production of urine. Right? Urine production is a place where an animal can control the overall amount of water that it's losing. Right? You could produce urine in large volumes or small volumes, and this is basically controlled by the kidney, which is also indirectly controlled by the endocrine system in the brain. We'll be talking about how this works soon enough, but for now I want to go into some basic chemistry involved in excretion. Now excretion is obviously related to the elimination of waste molecules, and when we talk about waste molecules, one that you should be thinking about is carbon dioxide. You uh, breathe your carbon dioxide out, you don't use your urinary system to get rid of it, but CO2 is definitely an example of a form of metabolic waste. Okay. You can also have excesses of ions and metabolites which have to be voided from the body, but our attention here is going to be focused primarily on nitrogen. And nitrogen containing compounds, and we'll call this nitrogenous waste. This is a main concern for us right now because a big part of what the urinary system has to get rid of is this type of waste, nitrogenous waste. And so the first thing I want to mention is that the amount of nitrogenous waste that's produced by an animal is going to be related to its diet. Okay, um, an herbivorous animal like this very cute bunny rabbit is going to have a diet that's relatively low in nitrogen, mostly carbohydrates, maybe some fats, but relatively little protein. And with a low nitrogen diet, you're placing a relatively small demand on your urinary system because you're not going to be producing that much nitrogenous waste. On the other extreme, you might have a carnivorous animal, like an ocelot, whose high-protein diet is going to be resulting in a lot more nitrogenous waste compared to what's produced by your typical herbivore. Okay? Now, the relationship between protein content in the diet and the production of nitrogenous waste is something that I want to go through uh, at a molecular level, because it's actually kind of important. Okay? One thing you might remember is that proteins get broken down in our digestive system into amino acids. And amino acids have a basic structure of having uh, an NCC backbone. The N is the amino group. The other C is a carboxyl group. And then in the central carbon, we've got a hydrogen that's being attached, as well as a, a variable side chain. That's the R group. Remember that? Okay. Now, if we were just to use this amino acid to produce our own proteins, that wouldn't result in any nitrogenous waste. We'd just be recycling parts. But when we start using these amino acids for energy, we basically have to take this portion of the amino acid and convert that into some type of metabolite that will be fitting into the Krebs cycle or glycolysis. This amino group has to come off in a process we call deamination. And when we deaminate, uh, if we were just to hydrolyze this amino group off, we'd be producing an NH3. Now, ammonia is a pretty nasty molecule to be putting into our system. Um, it's got somewhat toxic effects, but the main thing that it does is it alters the pH. Ammonia, I guess, is technically a weak base, but when you introduce ammonia into a pH 7 world, like what we have in most of our cells, it, it's going to recruit a hydrogen ion to create ammonium, NH4+, and this alters the pH of our system. Okay? So in other words, uh, one of the major effects of, of adding ammonia, of producing any significant quantities of ammonia, is that it's going to alter the pH, making it difficult for our systems to function normally. You know, we don't generally have the ability to function in a wide range of pHs, and if you alter the pH substantially, things just go terribly awry. Okay. So the way to think about this is that ammonia is the raw form of nitrogenous waste. It is what comes about as a result of deamination of amino acids, but most organisms, including us, we can't allow ammonia to build up in any significant quantities. It would result in alkalosis. We'd, we'd it, it would kill us, right? And so what we do is we convert the ammonia at some substantial energetic cost into something that's less toxic. And that less toxic thing is going to be urea. And urea looks like this. 
uh, it's actually made using two molecules of ammonia and one molecule of carbon dioxide. Basically, we take three molecules that are waste, that are metabolic waste, and we convert them into kind of like a form of the metabolic waste that can be tolerated at pretty high concentrations. And I'm hoping that your chemistry is strong enough that you can see the relationship, how we can actually get two molecules of ammonia and one molecule of carbon dioxide to uh, reconfigure their covalent bonds to produce one molecule of urea. But this is coming at some energetic cost. ATP molecules are needing to be expended, creating ADP and phosphate. And this energetic expenditure is necessitated because we need to make our ammonia less toxic. Now, urea has the advantages of being both water-soluble as well as being very tolerable. It's, it's very non-toxic. You know, think of the sharks and how they're able to elevate their overall osmotic concentration largely by allowing urea to concentrate in their tissues. Right? Even our kidneys operate on the principle that urea can be tolerated at fairly high concentrations in the blood, and this makes it pretty easy for us to take the urea out of the bloodstream and concentrate it in the urine. Okay. But urea is not the only form of non-toxic nitrogenous waste that can be produced from the ammonia. Uh, there's also uric acid. And uric acid, it's got this complex structure. Uric acid is chemically related to purines, which are like adenine and guanine, the two bases that are used in nucleotide synthesis. And one way that we get uric acid is from the catabolism of purines. When you consume food that's got a lot of nucleic acid in it, sometimes the nitrogenous bases that they contain are broken down into, into a form of nitrogenous waste. And you're always producing at least some uric acid because of purine metabolism. Okay? But there's some animals like birds, squamates, and butterflies, and terrestrial snails that use uric acid as their principal form of nitrogenous waste. And this brings up some interesting questions. Why, why would organisms want to use uric acid as opposed to urea? It's more costly to produce. It takes more energy to make uric acid. You pretty much have to go through the entire process of synthesizing a purine molecule and then turn it into uric acid, which is then going to be eliminated directly from the animal, right? In addition to being costly to produce, uric acid also has a property of being not very soluble in water. In the case of humans, uh, we sometimes suffer from two conditions that are associated with uric acid. Uh, because of its low solubility, it tends to precipitate out from aqueous solution. And if you get precipitation of uric acid in your extremities, it, it causes a condition, a very painful condition called gout, right? If you start to excrete uric acid in your kidneys, uh, at any significant concentrations, uric acid starts to precipitate. It crystallizes, forming uric acid crystals, which is basically a form of a kidney stone. right? But there are also some advantages associated with this low solubility. If you excrete your nitrogenous waste in the form of uric acid, you can eliminate all of your nitrogen without having to put it into an aqueous solution. You don't have to make urine in order to eliminate nitrogenous waste. You can allow it to precipitate and eliminate it with your feces, and that's what birds and snakes do, right? Now, the evolution of uric acid excretion is also something that's pretty easy to understand, and we tie it to a narrative that we've seen before. Uh, remember the amniote egg? that private pond in which um, our terrestrial vertebrate was developing. Okay. If you think about like a chicken or a lizard or a turtle, you got this really large mass of yolk, right? And the yolk is going to be the stuff that's going to be consumed by the baby lizard for the whole time of its development. And so if you have a lizard that's developing from this, maybe here are the arms, um, and here's the uh, head of the baby lizard, okay? And this embryonic lizard is developing and it's growing and it's also producing nitrogenous waste. And this waste could either stay in solution and eventually poison out this little private pond or it could settle out all at the bottom, right? And if it precipitates at the bottom, it's basically not polluting the pond and the animal is able to continue its development in a relatively low salinity environment, right? Uric acid excretion is all about animals needing to uh, produce some form of nitrogenous waste while they're in the egg that does not poison their little pond. Okay? Now most mammals, not including the duck-billed platypus of course because it also lays an egg, but most mammals have lost uric acid and this probably has a lot to do with the fact that they've taken a different turn in the way that they develop their babies. Okay? If baby is going to be hooked up to a placenta 
uh, through which we have the exchange of gases, nutrients, and wastes. At that point, it makes a whole lot more sense for the nitrogenous waste to stay in some type of aqueous solution in a non-toxic form like urea uh, so that it can be passed into mother circulation and it can be avoided with, with mother's urine. Now you might say that birds and snakes are very well suited to living under drought conditions. They don't need to figure in some form of necessary water loss with their elimination of nitrogenous waste. They can get rid of all of their waste without using water at all. Mammals don't have that luxury. Mammals are going to have to be losing at least some water with their urea. Okay. You might say that birds and snakes are, are better suited to life in the desert. But it wouldn't be appropriate for you to say that birds and lizards are adapted to living in the desert because of this characteristic of uric acid excretion. Okay? Now, why is it not an adaptation? Now, to understand this, you've got to look at the Latin roots of this word. Ad in Latin means toward. Basically, we're moving toward something. Okay? Something is an adaptation if it's directly related to an organism's evolution making it more well suited to a particular environmental challenge. Okay? If snakes had evolved uric acid excretion in response to life in the desert, then it would be a legitimate adaptation. Okay? That's not the case. Remember, snakes evolved uric acid excretion because it had to develop in an egg. Okay? If the desert was around at the time of this adaptation, it would have had nothing really directly to do with the evolution of uric acid excretion. Now, some people get around this by saying that birds and lizards are pre-adapted. They're, uh, they're already suited to life in the desert because of the uric acid excretion, and they do particularly well in the desert because of that. Now, before we lose sight of our overall objective here, which was to consider osmoregulation vis-a-vis -vis excretion, um, remember our mad bunny? He was trying to maintain a relatively steady osmotic balance. He was trying to maintain a constant internal osmotic concentration in spite of any fluctuations that were happening on the outside. And he was doing this by adjusting the overall volume of urine that he's producing. Under conditions when he's overhydrated, he would tend to produce a larger volume of relatively dilute urine. And under other circumstances where he's more water stressed, he'd more likely be served by producing a smaller volume of very concentrated urine. The ability to either concentrate your urine or to make a relatively dilute urine is part of the art of osmoregulation, and it ties to the excretory anatomy. And here's where we're going to be moving into the uh, basic anatomy of the mammalian excretory system. Okay. So I'm going to draw for you the standard picture of a mammalian, maybe a, maybe a human, excretory system. You've got a couple of kidneys. Uh, the kidneys are kind of buried in the back of your body cavity, in the back wall of your body cavity. The kidneys have these tubes that are coming out of them. These are the ureters, and the ureters basically pass the urine down into the urinary bladder. Okay. Now coming out of the bladder at the bottom end, you've got the urethra, which is going to be carrying the urine out to the outside world. For the males in the classroom, this is where you've got a, a nasty little gland here. It's called the prostate, and that's a big part of the reason why you're getting these animal lectures in the video format. Now, we can't really talk about kidney function without talking about the blood as well, because you've got the blood that's feeding the kidneys, it's coming down in the aorta. You've got a couple of renal arteries. The renal arteries are going to be taking blood out of the main aorta and carrying them to one to the left kidney, one to the right kidney, and that's going to be supplying the blood that's going to be going out. It's going to be serving the kidney tissues with energy, with nutrition, but also the blood in passing into the kidneys is going to be cleaned. That's kind of like the whole point of the kidneys. And the renal veins are going to be carrying blood back out of the kidneys, and that blood is going to be passing into the uh, inferior vena cava. The vena cava is going to be carrying the blood from the lower portion of the body. It's going to be carrying the blood up to the heart. Okay, so the blood is going to be going back to the heart over here. It's going to be receiving blood both, both from the uh, pulmonary vein on the left side as well as, as well as the pulmonary vein on the right side. So we'll basically have this flow of venous blood going back to the heart. Now the arterial blood, once it comes out, once it comes down, 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 comes out into the renal artery, it's going to be uh, splitting up into renal arterioles. 
right? Uh, the renal artery is going to be splitting up into tiny, tiny renal arterioles, and those renal arterioles are going to be uh, largely, you know, staying primarily within the outer layer of the kidney, and this is called the renal cortex. Okay. Yeah, parts of the uh, part, there, there are some blood vessels that are going to go down into the renal medulla and come back up. Uh, we'll hold, those will be the, vas the vasi recti, and, uh, but the inner layer of the kidney is called the medulla. In the basics of kidney anatomy, we identify three layers or three parts of the kidney. You've got the cortex on the outside. That's the part that's kind of generally uh, tubular, but the tubules are pointing in all different directions. You've got the renal medulla, in which all these tubules are pointing in and out. Okay. So you've got a bunch. Of, it's tri. It's striated. There's a nice term for you. Then you've got the renal pelvis, which is an interior space. The renal pelvis is the area into which the urine finally passes after it's done, after it's produced by the kidney. The urine, the waste that you pee out, is produced up here at the kidney in the renal pelvis. It passes down through the ureter, down to the urinary bladder, eventually uh, fills the bladder up, and when the bladder finally gets to the point where it's stretching out a little bit, that stretch receptor is detected in your brain and it causes you to want to go to pee, right? Now, apart from the blood vessels, we also have another unit that's really kind of crucial. It's this thing that we'll call the nephron. And I want to kind of draw off what the nephron basically looks like for you here. Now, the picture of the nephron typically starts with a renal arteriole. Okay, so we'll have an arteriole. Okay, it's carrying blood, right? The arteriole is going to be carrying blood into this structure called the glomerulus. And the glomerulus is a ball-shaped capillary. Okay, it's a ball-shaped and it kind of look, I guess not really capillary, it's a capillary-like structure, but the, uh, but the walls of the renal arteriole are relatively porous, and uh, out of the glomerulus, blood flows out through a different arteriole. This is called the efferent arteriole, as opposed to the afferent arteriole that we have carrying the blood in. Okay? There's also a little bit of a constricture right there, which causes the pressure in the glomerulus to increase, and because the walls of the glomerulus are relatively porous, there's a filtrate that passes out of the glomerulus and it's captured in the first part of the nephron. That first part of the nephron is called the Bauman's capsule, right? And the Bauman's capsule then connects to a tubule, a tubule that is very convoluted, and we call it the convoluted tubule. It's also the near side convoluted tubule because it's closest to the uh, glomerulus, and so we call this the proximal or near side convoluted tubule. And this convoluted tubule twists around for a little bit. I'm not showing all the twists, but then it passes into the deeper portion of the kidney. Remember the renal medulla. So now uh, this long straight part is going to be leaving the renal cortex, passing downwards into the renal medulla, where it makes a U-turn. And on the way up, it gets a little bit thicker. It gets a little bit fatter. And that part of the nephron is called the loop the loop of Henley, okay, or the medullary loop. Okay. When the ascending arm, when the arm going up of the loop of Henley gets to the top, back up to the renal cortex, we have another portion of convoluted tubules, where the tubule kind of goes back and forth, and eventually the tubule is going to hook up, it's going to connect with a collecting duct, okay, and the collecting duct is going to run back down into the renal medulla. It's going to be receiving the filtrate from the distal convoluted tubule, and at that point all that has to happen is the urine is going to be passing downwards through the collecting duct down to the renal pelvis. Now there are a couple of stories that I want to develop here. One involves the loop of Henle with, together with the vasa recta. Vasa recta because I want you to do a couple of things. I want you to remember that there is a blood supply to the kidney and the blood supply has to go all the way to the bottom portion of the renal medulla. Like those blood vessels can't stay up in the renal cortex the whole time. We need to serve the deepest portion of the renal medulla with respiratory gases, with nutrients, uh, all that has to happen as well. So, so some of these arterioles, some of these renal arterioles are going to be passing downwards into the renal medulla and as they do, as, as these arterioles are passing downwards, 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 they're going to be moving into an area of the kidney where the concentrations, where the osmotic concentrations are getting higher and higher. 
okay and so this uh, descending arm of the vasorecta is going to be carrying blood downward we're going to have an ascending arm of the vasorecta basically at that point by the, by the time the blood returns back up it'll be kind of part of the venous system and so you've got the ascending arm of the vasorecta as opposed to the descending arm of the vasorecta and you also have capillaries that are connecting the two basically you can have flow of blood from the descending arm to the ascending arm and this is going to be happening all along the loop of Henle. Right. Now while that blood is passing up and down in the vasorecta, you also have the filtrate, the stuff that's in the nephron. It's also passing downwards, downwards, downwards in the loop of Henle, in the descending arm of the loop of Henle, then it's passing upwards, upwards, upwards in the ascending arm. Okay. You might notice here they've got things uh, in the vasorecta, blood in the vasorecta, and filtrate in the loop of Henle that are flowing in exactly the opposite direction and very close to each other. Now I hope that hint triggered something in your brain that made you think of a counter current exchange mechanism because that's exactly what's going on here. I'm not going to try to give you the full detail here, but what we have here is kind of a supercharged example of countercurrent exchange. And it's actually called a countercurrent multiplier. Uh, the difference between a normal countercurrent exchange system and a countercurrent multiplier is that uh, normal countercurrent is entirely passive. We're always relying on passive forces like the passive diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide or the passive movement of heat uh, to get from one fluid to the other. Okay. In the case of a countercurrent multiplier, we actually boost that process even a little bit further with the expense of ATP energy. Okay. ATP is being expanded, and this is an active process. And so, what exactly is this active process countercurrent multiplier doing? Well, I'm glad you asked, because as we're talking about osmoregulation and the animal's ability to produce concentrated versus dilute urine, the thing that really interests us the most is this really spectacular gradient in osmotic concentration between the deepest portion of the real medulla down here where it's extremely hypertonic. We have an extremely high osmotic pressure, something on the order of maybe 1200 milliosmoles per liter, as opposed to the cortical areas up here where we're actually hypotonic relative to most of the tissues in the body. Remember our typical osmotic pressure in the physiological compartments of a vertebrate is around 300 milliosmoles per liter. In the renal cortex of a mammal it's closer to 200. In other words, it's really pretty dilute. Okay. And, and we maintain this concentration gradient from hypotonic to hypertonic in the kidneys at all times. And we do that by using this countercurrent multiplier mechanism, right? Effectively, what's happening is that the solutes that are carried, the solutes that are carried in the uh, filtrate are getting dumped out. Or they're getting actively exported from the loop of Henle in the deepest portions of the renal medulla. After we've offloaded all those solutes, the filtrate then passes back up without taking in any more solutes, but it is allowing water molecules to diffuse inwards, right? Okay. Similarly with the vasorecta, we're using the countercurrent flows of the vasorecta and the loop of Henle to actively generate this really strong concentration gradient. Now keep in mind that this gradient is going to start up here in the renal cortex at around 200 milliosmoles per liter. And as we pass deeper and deeper and deeper down into the renal medulla, the osmotic concentration is going to get greater and greater. Okay. Now here's the thing. Okay? The urine that passes in right up here at the very top of the collecting duct, right where the distal convoluted tubule is feeding the collecting duct, this is going to be isosmotic with the surrounding cortex. In other words, it's going to start off at around 200 milliosmoles per liter. If that urine were allowed to pass through the collecting duct and get all the way down to the renal pelvis, we would be producing a very dilute urine indeed. Okay. And that's what happens. I mean, if you're overhydrated, you're going to be producing a very dilute urine. Uh, we're going to be allowing this filtrate, this kind of completed urine filtrate, to pass through the renal medulla without undergoing any concentration. 
Now the control over how much water gets reclaimed from that filtrate as it passes down the collecting duct is going to be determined by the status of aquaporin proteins. Uh, these are proteins that are there in great number in the collecting duct wall and they could take one of two forms. You can have aquaporin proteins in a relatively open state and that would allow a greater volume of water to pass through basically uh, passing out of the collecting duct into the renal medulla. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if aquaporin proteins, if the aquaporin proteins are in their closed conformation, you won't have that mass excess of water molecules. Okay. The control over whether aquaporin proteins are open versus closed uh, takes place in a distant location, actually takes place in the brain. Remember the hypothalamus, that part of the brain that does a lot uh, related to homeostatic function. It detects the osmotic pressure that's there in your blood. When you're dehydrated, the osmotic pressure tends to increase. When you're overhydrated, it tends to decrease. In the hypothalamus, in response to certain types of stimuli, and in response to certain types of deviations from the, uh, from the norm, from where you want your osmotic pressure, it can activate its, its, some of its cell bodies, and the cell bodies are going to be sending a signal down to the posterior pituitary, and the posterior pituitary cells are going to be releasing a hormone called ADH antidiuretic hormone, which is then going to be passing into the bloodstream, going all the way to the kidneys, and having their effect on aquaporin proteins. Okay. Now let's see how well you're thinking about this. Okay. Given the fact that being in a state of dehydration means that your blood is going to have an elevated osmotic pressure, and dehydration is going to be resulting in um, an increase in the production of ADH. Basically, you'll, the response to dehydration uh, by the hypothalamus is to release ADH molecules from the posterior pituitary. How is ADH going to be affecting aquaporins? You've got two choices here. Is it going to cause aquaporins to open, or is it going to cause them to close? So I've given you the typical story, pretty much not any further than what we go through in Bio 110, the non-majors class. I expect that many of you will probably be taking some type of uh, more advanced physiology course where, you, where you'll be learning a lot more about the physiology of the human kidney. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is to take a slightly different turn and think about things that are more in line with the diversity that is kind of like the theme of Bio 202. One thing that not a lot of people know is that not every single one of the nephrons is going to have a really long loop of Henle that goes deep into the renal medulla. There are also these things called cortical nephrons. And the cortical nephron pretty much stays entirely within the renal cortex or maybe in the uh, shallowest portions of the renal medulla. In other words, these are nephrons that are not really taking part in the active production of a strong gradient. Okay. So now what I want you to do is to think about a comparison between two rodents, a beaver and a kangaroo rat. Okay. Uh, I think you all know what a beaver looks like. I think I've got a picture of a kangaroo rat here. I've deliberately chosen kangaroo rats because they really do indeed have very special kidneys. Now even though beavers and kangaroo rats are both rodents, in other words taxonomically there's not that much phylogenetic distance between them, there's a huge distance between them ecologically. Beavers are, for all intents and purposes, aquatic animals. They never stray very far from their world and that world is a freshwater stream or a freshwater pond. Okay. Kangaroo rats are at the opposite end of the spectrum. We find kangaroo rats in the driest deserts in the southwest. You can capture a kangaroo rat, bring it back to the laboratory, feed it a diet of grain, and give it absolutely no water whatsoever. And the kangaroo rat will be perfectly happy with that situation. Right? One of the reasons why kangaroo rats are able to persist with no water at all is the fact that they're granivores. And granivores with a primarily carbohydrate diet, they're going to be producing quite a bit of that metabolic water as a result of the breakdown of uh, sugars, of carbohydrates. Okay. The other thing that kangaroo rats have are spectacular kidneys. Okay. Remember that story of juxtamedullary, the long nephrons, as opposed to the cortical nephrons? Beavers have primarily cortical nephrons. Makes sense. Beavers really don't have to worry about ever needing to concentrate their urine. They could have kidneys with a relatively small gradient between the osmotic pressures of the cortex versus the deepest part of the renal medulla. Kangaroo rats, on the other hand, 
even though they're on a diet of primarily carbohydrates, they don't have any water. And when they produce urine, they're going to be producing a highly concentrated urine with, with barely any water in it at all. And so the kangaroo rat's kidney departs from the typical anatomy that we have in most mammalian kidneys. Most mammals are going to have kidneys like the one on the left, where you've got a renal cortex, renal medulla, and a pretty sizable area in the middle of the kidney that's the renal pelvis. Okay, when you look at the kangaroo rat's kidney, you don't see any renal pelvis at all. Okay? The renal medulla fills the entire kidney, and in fact, it actually goes part of the way down the ureter. This is a spectacular level of anatomical specialization, and it pretty much ties the kangaroo rats into producing a very concentrated urine at all times. It doesn't have any choice. You know, kangaroo rats have lost the ability to actually produce a dilute urine, and that probably has something to do with the fact that they've had a long history of life under very, very dry conditions in the southwestern deserts. Now another thing that I like to do in these lectures is to talk about the uh, diversity of different kinds of, of nephric systems we have in vertebrates. For example, a pronephros is really something that most of us uh, get beyond. This is something that would have been there in some ancestor, maybe, uh, maybe Amphioxus, Branchiostoma still has a pronephros, but most vertebrates would have pronephros during their embryonic development only, and they would get past this and develop something a little more complex, like a mesonephros. Okay? And so uh, when we look at the fish's kidneys, we would have probably noticed that the kidneys of a fish are very different from what we expect or from what we might know about from the, from the anatomy of a mammalian kidney. It doesn't look like a bean. It looks like a little um, bag of bloody tissue in the back of the fish's body cavity. Uh, that's because it's the mesonephros. We haven't really gotten to the kind of nephric system that we have in adult organisms, right? Uh, during embryonic development in mammals and in birds, the mesonephros degenerates, okay? and we have the development of the metanephros, which is something that's shown over here. Okay? The metanephros down here at the bottom is a structure that becomes more elaborate and becomes the kidneys. Okay? But in the case of mammals, one of the really interesting things that takes place is a repurposing of the mesonephros. It basically becomes part of the reproductive tract. In the case of males, which is on the right of this diagram, the mesonephros, the, 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 the embryonic excretory system, actually becomes the ductus deferens. We have the male gonad, the testis, actually hooking up with the old excretory system of embryonic development, and it, it simply gets repurposed. Okay. In the case of a female, uh, that mesonephros actually does disintegrate entirely. There's, there's nothing remaining of it at all. And the ovary gets hooked up with a duct that runs parallel with the mesonephros. Uh, sometimes it's called the paramesonephros, and in this diagram it's identified by its other name, which is the Mullerian duct. Right? I don't want to spend too much time on this particular issue, but I did want to point out uh, the relationship between the excretory system and the reproductive system and the fact that these two organ systems are actually very closely tied physiologically and, uh, and, the, and the connection can be seen by this examination of embryonic development. Okay. And so that's going to be the end of our lecture series in the animal unit and I guess it's time for you to start preparing for that examination.